Welcome to Smart Catalyst, Jan 2, 2019. So today we are going to see all these articles. The first one is RBI allows the restructuring of MSME loans up to 25 crore. The second one is Cineris Vulture cited in Jharkhand. The third one is Ganga water quality has improved. And the fourth one is Parliamentary Panel Flax neglect of Western Guards. And the fifth one is boost to plain packaging for tobacco products. And the sixth one is China seeks talks with India on Asia Trade Pact. And the last one is UPI transactions worth over 1 trillion. So the first article is RBI allows the restructuring of MSME loans which is up to 25 crores. So what the news here is the RBI has recently permitted a one-time restructuring of the existing loans to MSMEs which are in default state but they are standard asserts. So what is this standard asserts means? The assets which are very lesser risk or which are those whose repayment is regular. Okay. So the classification of assets which is lending to the any sector is classified as four categories. One is the standard, another one is the substandard, another one is doubtful, and the last categorization is loss. So what these all categories means is if it is a standard then the repayments by the borrowers is regular. So usually if the repayment of any loan are overdue for more than 90 days those loans are classified as or those assets are classified as non-performing assets right. So after classifying this as NPA which are non-performing assets and if the NPA remains for a period of less than 12 months. So for 12 months the NPA remain as it is, then it is substandard. But if the NPA remain as it is for more than 12 months, if it exceeds 12 months, then it is doubtful asserts. But if the asserts which are those where the money lent can't be recovered. So if we can't recover the loan at all, if we can't recover the borrowed money, then it is loss. Okay. So these are the four classifications of the asserts. So now the RBI permitted one-time restructuring of loans which are in standard asserts as on Jan 1, 2019 status. Okay. So RBI has permitted this one-time restructuring to MSME sector. So why MSME sectors means because it is the one which has been hurt by the disruption which is caused by both the demonetization in 2016 as well as the GST implementation in 2017. So only the central bank's board advised the RBI to consider a scheme in order to recast or restructure the loans of MSME thereby we can increase the liquidity in the market. Okay. So what is the deadline means this recasting of MSME loans has to be implemented by March 31st 2020. So what the bank should do for this recasting means each banks or non-banking financial companies should formulate a policy for this recasting with the board approval and those policies should include a framework for the viability of assessment of the stressed accounts first and then the regular monitoring of such restructured accounts okay so the guideline said the bank should classify the stress in such loan into three categories one is the special mention account zero special mention account one and two depending on the delay in repayments of the loan so what is this sma zero one and two means so if the delaying of repayment is between 31 to 60 days then it is sma one so if the delaying is between 61 to 90 days then it is sma two but so one thing you have to note here is even after the restructuring of loans of MSME, these loans still remain as the standard asset only and it turn bad only after a delay of payment of more than 90 days. Okay. So you have to know about the MSME sector. We all knew that it is an important component of the Indian economy and nearly 6% of the manufacturing GDP is contributed by MSME and 24% is contributed uh, from service activities of MSME as well as 33.4% of India's total manufacturing output is only contributed by MSME. And apart from this, the employment opportunities of around 120 million persons is contributed by MSME as well as 45% of the overall exports of our country depends purely on MSME. So it is very necessary at this point of time to take certain measures for creating an enabling an inducing environment for MSME sectors. So this restructuring of loans to MSMEs is available only to the MSME which are registered under the GST. Okay. 
and to be eligible for such kind of recasting, the MSME sh uh, exposure should not exceed 25 crores. So the resolution plan may be of three kinds. One is rectification, another one is restructuring, the third one is recovery. So what is this rectification, restructuring and recovery? So if you see rectification means the lenders are allowed to provide additional finance to the borrowers in order to run the business and in order to rectify. The second one is restructuring, which means the borrower's loan repayment schedule is extended. They are given some more time in order to repay and the interest rate is also get reduced under this restructuring to ease the repayment pressure for the borrowers. And the third one is recovery, which means the lenders pursue legal routes to recover the dues in order to recover the loans. So now the RBI is proposing this restructuring only. Okay. So the second article is Sinaras Vulture cited in Jargon. So what the news here is, two vultures which is of type Sinaras Vultures are seen in Hazari Bagh which is in Jharkhand. So this indicates that there is a good environment as well as enough food which is available for these vultures to thrive on their own in this Hazari Bagh which is in Jharkhand. So now we are going to see about this Sinaras Vulture. So its migration pattern is like during the winter month, it migrates from the mountainous regions of Europe and Asia to warmer places, including India. And it comes to northern parts of India, which is up to Rajasthan. But recently, it is actually, it can be seen also in Hazaribagh, which is in Jharkhand. So this is what makes the news. So if you see the IUCN status of this Sinaras vulture, then it is near threatened. Okay. And not only this vulture, but it is also was found along with three other endangered species of vulture, which are Himalayan griffon, white trumped vulture, as well as the long billed vulture. And the IUCN status of all these three are endangered. So certain important features of this vulture is it is one of the heaviest and largest raptures in the world. And in many countries, this is called as monk vulture, which is hooded. That is why the hooded means it is like a monk. So it resembles the hood of a monk and its distribution is like in the last 200 years, it is greatly decreased in numbers in most areas, especially by means of poisoning, habitat destruction, as well as the reduction of the food supply. So in many European countries, the species became extinct. So if you see, India is a home to nearly nine species of vulture and with the population of these birds dwindling, the country has launched a species recovery plan. Through this, the conservation of these species can be done by means of conservation breeding centers in different parts of the country. So one more major concern over here is the recent experiment showed that these captive vultures are highly susceptible to diclofenac. So this diclofenac is a painkiller to the cattle. So the scavengers or these vultures which feed on those dead animals or the carcass of these cattle are now getting lot of diclofenac in their body by means of bioaccumulation which leads to the loss of life of these species and it is declining at a rapid rate okay and in order to prevent that the government has also recently put a complete ban on the use of these diclofenac so similar kind of things should be taken by the government or any country in order to preserve or conserve these kind of species so the next article is Ganga water quality has improved. So the recent experiment has indicated that the dissolved oxygen levels as well as the biological oxygen demand has improved at certain locations of the Ganges river system or Ganges basin. So this two things that is the dissolved oxygen and the biological oxygen demand are conventionally used by the researchers in order to assess the quality of the water or quality of the river bodies because the aquatic life as well as the microbes which are thriving in the water bodies they majorly depends on the dissolved oxygen if suppose the dissolved oxygen is decreasing then it is going to adversely affect the aquatic life if the dissolved oxygen is increasing then it is going to thrive the aquatic life so it depends on the amount of oxygen which is in the water body so now we are going to see about this dissolved oxygen and the biological oxygen demand 
so the dissolved oxygen content of the water is very important for the survival of the aquatic organisms but if the presence of organic wastes as well as the inorganic wastes in the water is obviously going to decrease the amount of dissolved oxygen which is present in the water if you see if do or the dissolved oxygen in water is becoming well below 4 milligram per liter then it is highly polluted but if it is go further below of 8 milligram per liter then it is highly contaminated this is how they actually classify the dissolved oxygen content of the water but what factors determine the amount of do in the water means the surface turbulence photosynthetic activity as well as the oxygen consumption by the organism and the decomposition of the organic matter so if suppose consider a water body if it is having lot of organic matter then it is obviously going to consume more oxygen then it is going to reduce the dissolved oxygen in the water so this is what they they are telling here the higher the amount of waste the higher the rate of decomposition and the higher the o2 consumption thereby it decreases the do content of the water so we need more dissolved oxygen so now we are going to see about this biological oxygen demand so what is this bod means it is the amount of dissolved oxygen needed by the bacteria in decomposing the organic waste which are dumped into the water bodies so if the water body contains organic wastes then the amount of oxygen required in order to decompose those things that is what it known as bod so it is expressed as milligrams of oxygen per liter so the higher the bod the lesser is the dissolved oxygen so it is adverse for the aquatic species so the bod should be less okay so the BOD is an indicator of water pollution by the organic waste and it is not dealt with inorganic. It is purely limited to biodegradable materials. Hence it is not reliable method for measuring the entire pollution load of the water because it deals only about the organic wastes, right? So this is the Ganga Basin. It comprises of 11 states and 17 major tributaries including Yamuna, Koshi and Chambal. So it is a home to nearly 500 million people and it is home to nearly 140 fish species and two biosphere reserves one is the Nanda Devi as well as another one is the Sundarban National Park is in this Ganges Basin only and five endangered species including the Gangetic Dolphin and Royal Bengal Tiger is also uh, surviving in this Ganges Basin okay so the next article is parliamentary panel flags neglect of western Ghats. So what the news here is nearly 56,000 kilometers of the ecologically sensitive areas in the Western Ghats could not be earmarked as no go zones still and it is mainly due to the state government's insensitivity. So it is what recently put forward by the parliamentary panel. So because of this insensitivity towards the ecology of the Western Ghats it was in making like six states which is in the western gods region vulnerable to floods and landslides so we all aware of the catastrophic monsoon floods in kerala recently as well as in certain parts of karnataka and this is a major alarm bells for administration in the six states in the western god region like goa gujarat maharashtra kerala tamil nadu as well as karnataka so why western gods are under threat means because of lot of anthropogenic activities including large scale deforestation mining activities and construction activities which were carried out there which is actually hurting the ecology of the very ecologically sensitive as well as the biodiversity hotspot of our country so the same parliamentary panel has also examined the issues regarding the categorization of western gods as ecologically sensitive areas as per the recommendation of two different committees one is the madhav gadgil committee second one is the Kasturi Rangan committee so they are also looking into the recommendation of these two committees so if you see in this picture it is the Western Ghats region and in that the Kasturi Rangan report identifies nearly 60,000 square kilometer as ecologically sensitive area and Ministry of Environment and Forest Affairs draft notification also identify nearly 56,000 square kilometers ecologically sensitive area but the six states are not doing anything regarding this ecologically sensitive area notification so what is the way ahead so implementation of the recommendation of kasturi rangan report is only possible with active support of local population and as well as it requires intrinsic consultation with the state governments at micro level to achieve the desired objective of saving of our ecologically sensitive western gods so for that the ministry of environment is going to constitute a committee to address the issues and grievances of the local people who are surviving in that ecologically sensitive area 
So what is this eco-sensitive zone area means? It is a buffer zone which is around the protected area. So if it is the protected area, which is national parks or wildlife sanctuaries, anything. So the buffer zone which is around the protected area, this is what the ESA or ecologically sensitive zone. So it is up to 10 kilometers. Okay. So in this ESA area, they actually places certain restrictions on construction activities, industrial activities, and they also restricts the pollution and the extraction of the surface water from the area. Okay. So recently the Bandipur National Park is notified as ES is it area as per Karnataka government. So the next article is boost to plane packaging. So the news here is as per the WHO framework convention on tobacco control guidelines which is FCTC guidelines, the Australia is becoming the first country in the world to introduce plane packaging for the tobacco products. So what is this FCTC means? It is a framework convention on tobacco control. So if you see in this picture, it is the first global health treaty negotiated under the auspices of WHO. And as per this, it establishes tobacco control as the priority on public health agenda. So we have to take some actions in order to control the tobacco usage. And it also provides a political as well as a legal platform for adoption of sound evidence based tobacco control measures. And it also asks for the firm commitment from all the countries and accountability from all the countries. So it, it is having like 176 parties covering about 87% of the world's population and it came into force from 2005. Okay. So what does this plain packaging means other than brand and product names displayed in a standard color and font style, it prohibits the use of logos, colors and brand images as well as any kind of promotional information. So you should only put brand and product name in a plain packaging. So this move has struck a blow against the tobacco industry and why they are doing this means in order to improve the public health by reducing the use as well as the exposure to the tobacco products. Okay. So we all knew that our government has actually insisted the tobacco companies to put large pictorial warnings about the usage of the tobacco and its consequences. So as per the global adult tobacco survey of 2016-17, the percentage of users in India who thought of quitting this tobacco usage because of this kind of large pictorial warnings has actually increased. That means a lot of people are thought of quitting the tobacco usage. So along with the higher taxes for the tobacco products, with large pictorial warnings, this blind packaging without any colorful images can also serve as a major tool in order to deter the new users as well as it prompt the existing users to quit. So in steps of Australia, now India should also introduce similar legislation of boosting the blind packaging for the tobacco products. So that is what they proposed in this article. Okay. So the next article is China seeks talk with India on Asia trade pact. So what the news here is, we all knew that about the Belt Road Initiative, which is an initiative of China and RCEP, which is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, along with this BRI initiative, which is majorly aimed to build investment as well as trade links among the countries along the old Silk Road to Europe, is a key element in China's efforts to seize the geographical and geopolitical advantage. So we all knew about this RCEP, which is the regional comprehensive economic partnership which is an economic partnership among the countries which include 10 asian countries as well as plus six countries which are india australia new zealand china japan and south korea so these 10 plus 6 RCEP countries are aiming to increase their trade deals as well as in order to increase the economic partnership among these countries. But it is still not concluded. That means it, it was started in the year 2012 and in the year 2018 only they actually came to a conclusion of establishing RCEP trade pact in the year 2019. So why this lagging of this RCEP means because it clearly shows the suspicion of the Asian trading partners over the China's dominance in the particular region. So all the Asian trading partners are doubtful about the China's dominance. So that is why it is still dragging. So from India's side, actually, we have drawn up a list of issues to China about this RCEP. The two major thing is 
about providing the zero duty access to fewer Chinese goods as well as India also seeks a longer period to phase out completely the levies on the Chinese good for even more period compared to 20 years which is offered to other countries. So apart from China, India is also planning to reach out to key players like Singapore and Australia to seek a consensus on these kind of issues. Okay. So the last article is UPI transactions worth over 1 trillion. So what the news here is, December month was the first month when nearly 600 million UPI transactions were recorded. So it shows that India is moving towards a cashless economy. So we all knew about this UPI which is a payment system launched by NPCI which is the National Payments Corporation of India. This NPCI is a not-for-profit company which is registered under Section 8 of the Companies Act. So this NPCA is only launched this UPI which is the Unified Payment Interface. So it is an umbrella organization for all the retail payments in India, NPCI. So this UPI actually facilitate the instant fund transfer between two bank accounts. So we all knew about this BIM app which is the Bharat Interface for Money app. So in that app you have to link your mobile number to the bank account. So you don't need to give any kind of beneficiaries, bank detail, anything. Simply you have to link your bank account to your mobile number. So this enables the instant fund transfer between two bank account on a mobile platform so without requirement of further detail. So if you see about this NPCI, National Payments Corporation of India, it is an umbrella organization for all the retail payments in India, which is incorporated in the year 2008. So presently 56 banks are shareholders of this NPCI and in that we are having public sector, private sector, foreign banks, multi-state cooperative banks and regional rural banks. So it was set up actually under the guidance and support of RBI and Indian Banks Association. So why NPCI has introduced these kind of UPI means in order to curb the fake transactions as well as regulating the fintech companies from inflating their UPI numbers. So recently also NPI launched UPI 2.0 version with several new features including overdraft facility which means you can withdraw money even if you are not having any balance in your account and the customers can link this overdraft facility account to the payment system thereby they can transfer that money also to the others. So apart from this a one-time feature which is allowing the customers to pre-authorize a transaction and pay at a later date which means like lazy pay so you can pay at later date and but still you can have the transaction so this is also introduced by the NPCI but only one restriction over here is the fintech companies or the private companies are still not allowed to use this UPI 2.0 platform because of the government's recent move and the Supreme Court's verdict of usage of the other linked features they actually ban the usage of other linked features by the private entities, right? So that is a barrier for the fin fintech companies to use this UPI platform.